Hello, welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Simpoga, and here is what's coming up. And our shared history then is an underpinning of the relationship that we have today. That's U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris speaking after her river today in Lusaka. Coming up, lots more coverage on Harris's trip, an explanation of former U.S. President Donald Trump's court case, and famed South African athlete Oscar Pistorius remains in prison. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. The U.S. government says it will, it will provide more than 500 million U.S. dollars in bilateral assistance to Zambia this year. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris made the announcement at a news conference with Zambian President Haikande Chihachilema in Lusaka today. Harris is on a two-day visit to the Southern African country. Katha Short reports from Lusaka. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris says her visit demonstrates the United States' commitment to advancing its cooperation with Zambia. She held closed-door talks with Zambian President Hagainde Hichilema before their news conference. She adds the aid includes a renewed focus on economic transformation, increased investments in democracy, global health, and climate change solutions. And our shared history then is an underpinning of the relationship that we have today. Today, the president and I had a discussion on a number of important issues. Uh, we discussed, for example, as the president has mentioned, our shared commitment to democracy. I want to thank the president publicly for co-hosting the Summit for Democracy yesterday. At the news conference, Hichilema praised the U.S. for its continued assistance to various sectors of the economy. At Zambia has a clear focus on what we want to do. We were elected on a platform of delivering a functioning economy. Reconstructing the economy is our critical agenda because we know when we do that, we'll be able to take care of the needs of our people. Education for the young, health service delivery for our people, looking after the, looking after the old, looking after those that live with disabilities. In response, Harris called on creditor nations to speed up the restructuring process for developing countries like Zambia. Harris also visited her maternal grandfather's house in Lusaka, where she visited as a child. Her grandfather, diplomat Painganadu Venkantara Mangopalan, was instrumental in Harris' life as he inspired her to get involved in public life. Harris also said the U.S. is not in competition with China over Africa. Harris is the latest senior U.S. official to visit the continent since January following Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. In addition, last month, First Lady Jill Biden was on the continent. For VOA News, I'm Kathy Short, Lusaka, Zambia. Zambia's government sees the U.S. Vice President's visit as an opportunity to be involved with U.S. President Joe Biden's push to engage economically and diplomatically with African nations. Harris visit follows the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in December and U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to Lusaka earlier this year. VOA's Peter Kilote spoke with Zambian Foreign Minister Stanley Kakubo, Kakubo about his government's goals for his, this visit. And we were encouraged when Secretary Yellen came into Zambia and we enhanced those discussions. And then for the discussions that we had with uh, uh, Secretary Yellen to be followed by enhanced discussions with the U.S. Vice President, it means that we are getting closer to establishing a proper framework, a proper strategy of how we can get some of that money sitting here in Lusaka in terms of investments. And already we are getting a good vibe, a good indication from the U.S. private sector that they want to do to have a footprint in our economy. And that can only be positive, And we want to enhance that partnership. That was Zambian Foreign Minister Stanley Kakubo. He spoke to my colleague Peter Klote yesterday from Lusaka. You can hear the full interview on Saturday and Sunday on VOA's Nightline Africa, hosted by Peter. As you just heard, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris left Tanzania today and arrived, has arrived in Zambia. She met President Samia Suluhu Hassan on Thursday in Tanzania's commercial capital Dar es Salaam, 
For more on that last day of her visit to Tanzania, I spoke with journalist Idi Uwesu. Today it was a day of saying goodbye. Uh, Tanzania uh, say uh, goodbye to uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, who she concluded uh, her visit here in the country. Uh, and today he, she had uh, no uh, public activities. It was only uh, ceremonies at the airport where uh, a vice president of Tanzania, Dr. Philip Mpango, uh, was the one who said goodbye to Vice President Kamala Harris. But yesterday, uh, it was a very busy day for her since uh, morning where she uh, met uh, her host, President Samia Sulu Hassan, and then she went to a national museum uh, where she laid a wreath at the memorial uh, to the 1998 terrorist bombing uh, of the U.S. Embassy uh, here in Dar es Salaam. And then uh, she also met uh, young entrepreneurs who showcased their works to Vice President Harris. And uh, it was one of the things that uh, uh, showed to, to impress uh, VP Harris. And she said that uh, they, they gave her great hope about the future of Africa and uh, the world at, at large. In the evening, she went back to the State House where there was a special Easter uh, prepared uh, by her host, President Samia Sulu, and other uh, delegates who came together uh, with Vice President Kamala Harris. So it was a, a kind of a historic a visit uh, of the Vice President Kamala Harris here in Tanzania, and everybody seems to be happy uh, with her presence here. Before she came, uh, most people there had high expectations. Were those expectations met according to people you're talking to? It's true. People expected uh, a lot uh, from this uh, visit. And uh, um, uh, to some whom I've been uh, talking to, they, they, they say, yeah, with agreements that have been made uh, between the U.S. and Tanzanian government, say they are going to open uh, various uh, opportunities, especially jobs and uh, income creation uh, at the national level and uh, individuals, since the projects that are going to be uh, started or are going to be undertaken are going to have a lot of opportunities. Sectors such as health, education, technologies are the ones that are a number of people here in Tanzania. And uh, you can see that uh, most of the people are shown their appreciation with the support of the United States that are going to put in such sectors. That was Idi Uwesu. I see spoke with me from Dar es Salaam. Harris began her trip to the continent on Monday in Ghana. She's, in the fifth, she's the, the fifth major U.S. political leader to visit the continent in recent months, part of U.S. President Joe Biden's push to build stronger ties with governments on the continent. Harris spent much of her trip focused on empowering women and, and the youth, fostering innovation, and encouraging good governance. You are listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Impoga in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. For world news, check out voanews.com. Tunisia today launched a quota system for drinking water and banned using drinkable water in agriculture until September. Reuters says the Agricultural Ministry also prohibited the use of drinking water to wash cars and clean streets and public places. Violators face a fine and imprisonment of between six days and six months. Authorities say Tunisia is experiencing its fourth straight year of drought, including a scarcity of rain over the last six months. It has also experienced a drop in its dam capacity to 1 billion cubic meters, or 30% of the maximum. A senior farmers' union told Reuters news the country's grain harvest will be disastrous, with yields declining by about 66%. 
Former U.S. President Donald Trump is expected to turn himself in and appear in court on Tuesday in New York after a grand jury there indicted him. Specific charges have not been made public. He is the first ex-president to be charged with a crime. For more, VOA's Carol Van Dam asked Ann Chominsky, associate professor of law at New York Law School, to ex- explain an indictment, what this case is about, and discuss whether Trump could be sent to jail. An indictment is just a really fancy way of saying a charging document. It's a type of document that we use that contains criminal charges. Um, Indictments need to contain felonies, which is our highest level criminal offense um, in the United States. What is this case, this particular case about that we understand that the grand jury came back and indicted Trump with? So right now, we don't know the exact charges because the indictment is under seal, meaning it's not public yet. However, based on our educated guesses, our best guesses of what we know so far, we believe that the charges are surrounding an interaction between Mr. Trump, his lawyer, and another woman um, having to do with payments to keep this woman silent right around the 2016 election. And specifically at issue is whether or not there was what's called falsification of business records. And in New York State, falsification of business records is a misdemeanor, which is a crime. And if there's falsification of business records in furtherance of another crime, that actually elevates it to that felony level, that higher level offense. And there has been talk of that, the the, uh, charge of furtherance of a crime. Can you explain that? So the idea is um, if there is falsification of business records, just falsification of business records. So, for instance, if these payments were categorized as legal expenses, but they were not actually legal expenses, that's a lower level offense, a misdemeanor. However, if they were falsified records and the reason that they were falsified was either to commit another crime or to conceal another crime, in this case, potentially illegal campaign contributions, then that would elevate this to that felony level offense, the more serious criminal offense. If Mr. Trump is found guilty of these uh, charges, could he be sent to jail? If he's charged with a misdemeanor or a felony, both of those do carry um, jail or prison sentences with them. With respect to the felony charges, falsification of business records, the felony level offense, that is a felony and it carries up to four years in prison. How would all this affect his run for president again in 2024? So from a legal perspective, um, it does not prohibit him in any way from running for president or even becoming president. Um, Our understanding is there are very few limitations in the Constitution, in our Constitution, or I should change it and say there are very few requirements in our Constitution in order to qualify to be president. So for him to run, he can have pending criminal charges against him. He could be even convicted of these charges and still run for president. That is Anne Chomitsky, Associate Professor of Law at New York School of Law. She was speaking with my colleague, Carl Van Dam. South African former Paralympian Oscar Pistorius lost his bid for parole today after the parole board determined he's not eligible for release until August 2024. The world-known track star was jailed for 13 years after he shot and killed his girlfriend, Riva Stankip. Tuso Kumalo reports from Pretoria. Pretoria Correctional Services spokesperson Singabako Ngumalo told journalists Friday the parole board went through Oscar Pistorius' profile and submissions for parole. The members also received oral submissions from Riva Stankamp's mother, June Stankamp. The board concluded that Pistorius had not served the minimum period of his sentence required for him to qualify for parole. Asked why the hearing took place, Mumalo said the board only recently learned of the required minimum period. The clarification order from the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, we can share it with colleagues, it's not a certain document, it was only received on the 28th of March, meaning two days ago. Mumalo spoke to journalists outside the Hosi Mamburu Correctional Services in Atretville. Tanya Cohen, 
the Steenkamp's family lawyer, told journalists the hearing was difficult for River's mother. Cohen said June Steenkamp was relieved that Pistorius was not present when she gave the board her submission. Tanya said June Steenkamp and her husband Barry strongly oppose Pistorius being granted parole. She doesn't feel that he has, is rehabilitated. He hasn't told the truth. And for that reason, both her and Barry submits that he should not be released on parole. Pistorius testified at his trial he thought he was shooting at a burglar when he fired four times through a bathroom door. He was convicted of murder in 2016. Known as the Blade Runner, Pistorius won several Paralympic track medals and made history at the 2012 London Olympics as the first double amputee to compete. He made the semi-finals in the 400-meter race. The parole board is expected to consider a parole request next year. Reporting for VOA News in Johannesburg, I am Tusokumano. Pope Francis is expected to leave hospital Saturday pending the results of his medical tests. He's scheduled to take part in a Palm Sunday service at St. Peter's Square this weekend, an event that kicks off Holy Week services for Roman Catholics. The 86-year-old pontiff was taken to a hospital in Rome two days ago where he was diagnosed with bronchitis and given an infusion of antibiotics. The French news agency AFP says on Friday morning he had breakfast, read newspapers, and did some work in the private purple suit in the hospital. Pope Francis has suffered a number of, Ill- of health issues in recent years and was hospitalized in 2021 for an inflammation of the lining of the colon. <laughs> 